Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Alleyhu, alleyhu, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be open unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every That proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. It is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Make me an instrument of your peace. I want to know what it's like to follow you. When men look at me, I want them to see the light of the world inside It is in giving that we receive It is in pardoning that we are pardoned And it is in dying that we are born Eternal life. Make me an instrument of your peace. I want to know what it's like to follow you. When men look at me, I want them to see the light of the world inside. When men look at me, I want the light of the world inside. Thank you for joining me this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, we thank you so much for today. I thank you for your uh, beautiful weather that we're having here in Idaho, Lord. I pray for those that are in the parts of the country that are so blistering hot right now and receiving terrible uh, storms. Lord, I pray specifically for those in Periton and those in Matador, Texas, among so many other places around the country, but those places in particular that we know from back home that have had such terrible devastation in the last week or so with the tornadoes. And I pray that you would sustain those people, bless them, take care of them, put people in their path to restore what they have lost. And Lord, for those that have lost lives and loved ones, Lord, I pray that you would comfort those that have lost, that you would comfort their hearts, give them comfort, give them peace, give them rest from the difficulty of losing a loved one. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to trust you no matter what, knowing that all these terrible things that happen come from the devil, who is the prince of the air, your word tells us, and the father of lies, who would tell us that you're the cause of all these terrible things when we know for a fact that he's the cause of the terrible things, our enemy, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking that which he would, which he would devour, and that you, as it says in Romans 8, 28, make all things, bring them together for the good of those that love you, and are called according to your purpose. Lord, call us according to your purpose. Help us to know that you love us 
and help us to love you and trust you, knowing that you love us and want what is best for us. Lord, we ask that you would open up your word to speak to us this morning from the Psalms, that we might know how to follow you, to listen to your counsel, to not listen to man, not listen to the world, not listen to the the voices that are coming in and telling us about bad, terrible things that are happening to us because of us or because of other people or because of you, but that we would truly understand that it is because of the evil one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But you come to give us life and give it to us in abundance. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I would ask that you would continue to pray for those who have been in the the path of devastation, whether it be tornadoes or hail or other issues that are going on. There are some in Hawaii right now that are dealing with the uh, Mount Kilauea that is erupting again and has been for a few days now and, and is causing grief there as it does off and on all the time. But those are all things that we know come from a fallen world. We've talked about that here before. And so I pray that you'd remember that and uh, remember those people in your prayers. Um, I would ask that you'd look to Psalm 1 today, Psalm 1. It's a very short psalm. We're going to read the whole thing, and I want to talk through it just for a minute. I'm continually reminded of the need to know these things because we are always listening to and looking to and asking people's opinions. There are so many opinion polls out there. There's always people coming along Asking, what do you think about this? Sticking a microphone in somebody's face or have a, a survey pad. Didn't you used to avoid those people at the mall? <laughs> when you were going to the mall or to Walmart or whatever, and there was some guy there, and he had a notepad, and he was going to ask you questions. You kind of went by hiding, hoping he didn't see you. We, we always want to know what other people's opinions are, but we don't like giving our opinions, do we? I don't like to give my opinion. I want people to trust the Lord and listen to his word and not really mine. I'll get to that in a little bit. But I want us to look at Psalm number, chapter 1, and it says this. Beginning in verse 1, we're going to read the whole thing. It's only six short verses. It says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. First and foremost, we need to remember and look at the fact that he's talking about who is blessed and who is not blessed, the righteous and the wicked. God's word tells us in Proverbs, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We've looked at that before. It goes with the automatic opposite. If you are not a nation whose God is the Lord, if you are a nation who has turned its back on God, you will not be blessed. I don't think we can argue for one minute whether or not the United States has been blessed. We have been. But I think we have been blessed in spite of ourselves. Not because we deserve it and not because we have made God our Lord. Because he has ordained and guided and directed the forefathers and the people that established this country. And you may not believe that. That's not nationalism. That's not thinking we're better than anybody else. Don't go tell everybody that I'm some crazy person that thinks we're better than everybody else. My point is this. We would not have lasted as long as we have lasted if it was not for the grace of God. Because we do not deserve to last as long as we have lasted. We spent a little bit of time a couple of weeks ago in Memorial Day, remembering those who gave their lives for this country. We don't deserve for them to have given their lives for us. Not anymore. Not the country we have become. We'll talk about that more in the coming weeks because we're going to talk about morality. We're going to talk about holiness and we're going to talk about decency. And we're leading up to a place where I'm going to deal with some major issues that are going on with this country right now, that are going on in this world right now. Some things that we are accepting, applauding, 
and celebrating that are just flat wrong and are leading us in a terrible, terrible direction. But I'm not going to tell you my opinion. I'm going to tell you what God's word has to say about those things. So as we say that, with that being said, I want you to remember what he's talking about is the ones who are blessed are first and foremost the ones who do not hang around with as their gang, their group, their their posse, <laughs> or their brothers, or their team, or whatever you want to call it, their entourage, those who are unbelievers. We cannot surround ourselves as our group of friends, our closest comrades, those who do not believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You can do it, but you should not do it. We cannot be hanging around as our, our circle of friends, people that do not believe the same as we do. You know, when God's word says, do not be unequally yoked, people made that into a lot of things that it wasn't. It was basically this. He didn't want the Jews to marry outside of the Jewish faith because outside of the Jewish faith in that time of the world, they didn't believe in God. They worshiped idols. They had child sacrifices and all kinds of crazy stuff. That's why we ought not to be unequally yoked. It doesn't just mean in our marriage. We should not be yoked up in business, in close friendship, and in our circle of friends with people that don't, do not believe the same way we do spiritually and scripturally. We should surround ourselves with our closest circle of friends that believe the way we do so that there is no conflict of character, morality, and judgment. We do not hang around with unbelievers. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Some versions say good judgment because they're going to start leading you into things that the world would do. And God says not to be a person in the world, but to be in abiding relationship with his son Jesus. He says to be a, a, a friend of the world in James 4, 4 is to be at enmity with God or against God. So we can not only not hang around with them and be our buddies and be our circle of friends, we need to be very, very careful not to take serious counsel from them. We need to not go to them for specific advice on life lessons. Now, there are exceptions to that when, if you look at the whole picture because you may know somebody that's lost that is very smart in finances. But you got to be careful that they are ethical. If they are not a believer in Jesus Christ and they don't follow Jesus Christ, they might lead you down a legal but unethical path in financial advice and matters. One exception I know of is my son. My son was uh, estranged from us for some years. And it took, actually, we prayed for years that God would put somebody in his path he would listen to. He wouldn't listen to us. He wouldn't listen to the Lord. But maybe he would listen to somebody if they would speak to him. And a guy that wasn't even a Christian told him and gave him some advice, you need to get hold of your parents. You need to build that relationship back. You need to rebuild your family relationship that you've broken by your bad choices. He listened to that guy. That is a rare exception when someone who is lost will give you advice that is wise and is right and is what God would tell you to do. That's a rare, rare exception. That might happen. But when someone gives you advice like that, you need to make sure it lines up with the Scripture. So even in cases where someone may give you advice that's a lost person, you need to be careful to weigh that with Scripture and make sure that it matches up. Do not take counsel from a lost person, especially on spiritual, scriptural matters. Because you know what they're going to tell you? Oh, that ain't hurting nothing. All that little drinking ain't going to hurt anything. All that little bit of marijuana isn't going to hurt. Oh, it's okay for them to do this or to them to do that. It doesn't affect you. It's all right. You know, you can do that all you want to. It doesn't hurt anybody. It's a, it's a victimless crime. There are no victimless crimes. There is no victimless sin. Sin will find you out. And it will be planted first as a little bitty thing and then it grows and it grows and it grows and God's word tells us it eventually ends in death. Don't take counsel or guidance from someone who does not believe in Jesus Christ the way you do. Blessed is the one who doesn't do what the lost are doing 
and make a practice of things that are sin or draw you away from the Lord. You know, we live in a world now where they say anything goes. There's grace. Paul said, how can we keep sinning that grace may abound? Heaven forbid. We can't keep living in sin, those of us that are dead to it. We have this mindset that because we live in the age of grace, we can just do whatever we want to. God's going to forgive us anyway. He is. But what do you do about the passage that says, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. What do you do about that? You're not being holy if you're just sinning on purpose, knowing that eventually God will forgive you anyway. That's ulterior motives, and that's a pretty sorry way to do. The Bible would not support that at all. God's Word doesn't support that in any shape, form, or fashion. Heard a guy say the other day, well, a little bit of booze won't help, won't hurt. Oh, a little bit of cussing won't hurt. A little lie won't hurt. A little bit of adultery won't hurt. What? Wait a minute. Same logic. If you're saying a little lie won't hurt, a little bit of booze won't hurt, a little bit of drugs won't hurt, well, is a little bit of adultery okay? What if you came home and caught your spouse in adultery and they said, oh, it's just a little bit. Is that going to be okay? No. Sin is sin, and one little bit taints the whole batch. One bad apple will rot a whole case of apples. A little bit of sin is not good. A little bit of sin is just as bad as a lot of sin. And he also says that blessed is the one who does not sit in the seat of scoffers. In other words, you don't participate with scoffers. One thing we do that matches up with sitting in the seat of scoffers or participating in in the scoffing of the world, the lost world, is when somebody says, you know, let me play devil's advocate here. Folks, you should never play devil's advocate in any shape, form, or fashion. You do not need to be the devil's advocate. And if there's another part or another opinion, you need to be careful that that other opinion is the godly opinion, not the devil's advocate opinion. You should never play devil's advocate. That is sitting in the seat of scoffers. That is the person who does not trust in what God would say, but says, now let's look at it from a different viewpoint. No, that doesn't work. I've heard people try to justify their sin or the sin in other people's lives. So saying, now let's look at this from their point of view. No, I don't want to look at it from their point of view. I don't want to look at anything from anybody else's point of view. I don't want you to look at anything from my point of view. I want you to look at things from the Word of God point of view. We should always be weighing out everything we do with the Word of God. I had a guy say one time from the pulpit, talking to a bunch of college students, biggest group of college students in that town of any church, and he said, God is too busy to worry about things that you have to decide on a day-to-day -day basis like whether you pass a test, what classes you're going to take next semester, or who you're going to date and marry. He's too busy with the big things in the world. He gives you common sense to figure that out on your own. Yeah, he's not concerned about that stuff. He wants us to just figure that out on our own. That's why we have almost 60% divorce rate in this country, because we're figuring it out on our own. We're, we're, we're marrying that girl that's a hot mama instead of the one that is godly and looking after God's own heart. We're marrying that guy that turns us on and his, we think he's hot, we think he's awesome, and he's athletic and he's brilliant in some way that we have figured out in our mind we want that makes us lust after that person instead of saying, is that the godly person that God has chosen for me? That's why we have a 60% divorce rate in this country because God's not dealing with all. He's just letting us do it on our own. That's, that's preposterous. That's heresy. God is concerned about every single thing. I wanted to say, yeah, he doesn't care about who the, you know, those little things like who we marry and all that stuff. He's too busy counting the hairs on our head. If he knows our days numbered exactly how many they are, if he knows every single hair on our head, if he knows every star in the sky, he is concerned about every little thing in our life. Don't you take the counsel, even of a person who says they are a pastor or a preacher or a person of God that tells you that bunch of hooey. Because God is concerned about every single thing. He said, blessed is the one who delights 
in the law of the Lord and meditates on it day and night. He delights in the law or what is right in the eyes of the Lord, not in man or what man's opinion is. Listen, again, I'm telling you, do not go by my opinion. I got a lot of opinions. I like bay horses and gray horses, but there's a lot of people who can't stand bays and grays. I knew a guy one time, he said, I hate gray horses and I hate mares. Well, I like both, all right? So I can't go by his opinion and never ride a gray horse or never ride a mare. I need to go by what I experience is true. You can't go by my opinion and I'm not gonna go by your opinion. You need to go by God's opinion. Galatians 1.10 says, okay, am I here to please man or am I here to please God? Now I'm paraphrasing, but it says, am I here to please man? Or am I here to please God? Because if I'm here to please man, I can no longer be a servant of Christ. If we're not here to serve God, what are we here for? That's why we were created, was to serve God and tell others how they can serve God. How we can have a relationship with them and tell others how they can have a relationship with them. That's the only reason we're even created, folks. And if you think you're here for any other reason to be the best football player in the world, to be the best looking guy or the top hand cowboy of the world, then you are fooled by the world because you are not here for any other reason but to know Jesus Christ and tell others how they can know Jesus Christ. That's it. Everything else is peripheral. And that's not my opinion. That is exactly what God's word tells us. My opinion is irrelevant. I need to tell you what God's opinion is. I tell you what God's word says. We don't listen to other men. We, You know, I have a stack of books people have given me to read, and I've read them over the years. I've read a bunch of books. I read a lot when I have time. I read. Didn't used to, but I do now. And I read a lot of those books, and I'll get through part of them, and I just put them down because I have heard what they preach and what they say so many times from so many people. It's nothing new. Solomon said nothing new under the sun, all right? I rarely read something that I think is just brilliant. And when I do, I'll let you know, all right? I know that there have been some books over the years that have changed my way of thinking, have changed my whole life, have impacted me in such a way that I was never the same. One book is a very, very small book called A Tale of Three Kings. It's a look at the life of David, how he related to King Saul, and how he related to his son Absalom and how all of them at one point or the other either were or could be God's anointed and how David reacted to that. It's an amazing little book. You can read it in, a, in an afternoon. Gene Edwards, Tale of Three Kings. You need to read that book. There's another book that I read by a guy that I know I've read, I've read several of his books, but the one that for some reason just impacted me so much was uh, Erwin McManus's book, The Way of the Warrior. And it touched me. I've read it three times, and I'm starting it a fourth time. I just read it, and I read it, and I read it. There's so much in there that's so good. But I think we can spend way too much time reading what other people say. I've said several times, my favorite book in, in seminary was The Great Physician by G. Campbell Morgan because it was about all the one-on-one -on -one encounters that Jesus Christ had with people through the New Testament. Those are great books, and they're things that have impacted my life. But don't Spend so much time reading what other people think that you neglect the reading of the Word of God. If you've got time to read, you've got time to read the Bible. If you've got time to memorize a cowboy poem, you've got time to memorize some scripture. You've got time to memorize a new song, you've got time to memorize the scripture. If you've got time to watch Gunsmoke, which I do a lot, we've got time to read God's Word. We should be studying what God's Word says, not what man says. And we should meditate on it, ruminate on it, and study it to know the Word of God. You know, the whole rumination process is that cow's got four stomachs. And he chews it, he swallows it, it rolls around in that first stomach, comes back, he chews it again, goes to the second stomach, he comes back, he chews it again, he goes to the third stomach, he goes, come back, chew. he keeps chewing. That's why you see a cow laying out there in the shade, going, chewing that cud. Because it ruminates. He doesn't just eat it, swallow poop, pardon me, but it ruminates, it circulates. It grows in there so that every single cell and morsel 
that is utilized to his betterment. Every single particle of food that could go to the betterment of his body is utilized before what's waste is gotten rid of. There is nothing wasted in the Word of God. If we ruminate on it, if we ruminate on it, every single word from the Word of God can change our lives, will impact us in such a way that we will never be the same. Very rarely have I ever gone to any event or spent any time in the Word where it literally transformed me, but there have been times where I knew from that second I would never be the same for the better. That's the way God's Word speaks to us if we will ruminate and meditate on it so that we know the Word of God. Not just so we can quote John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life, but that we know other parts of the Word and we understand them to know what they really mean. You're not going to do that if you don't spend time in the Word of God. You know, the blessed person, separate from that one who is not blessed because it's a difference of who made God the Lord of their life, the, the blessed person is likened in this passage to a fruit tree that is planted by water. He's going to soak that water out of the ground. Now, I don't know about you, but in our part of the country, down in the middle of Texas, over the years of the cattle drives coming up from those wild cattle coming up from Mexico and South Texas, and now tons of cattle being shipped all over the country, there has been a built-in planting and fertilizing system in the way in the form of a bovine cow to spread mesquite trees all over the Southwest. And they are the bane of our existence because though they produce some bit of a shade and they're pretty and green, they suck every bit of moisture out of the ground. And it takes hundreds of gallons of water soaked out of the ground to sustain them water that would that would make grass thrive and so we fight that battle all the time in our part of the country over moisture that is sucked out of the ground by those awful mesquite trees and that's why people spend thousands of dollars grubbing them and, and bulldozing them and cutting them and killing them and spraying them and if they could figure out something in A&M that they could fly over with a crop duster and kill all those things it wouldn't kill all the oak trees too I guarantee you they'd get rich off of it as if a and not already rich. <laughs> but anyway, wouldn't that be a great thing? But a fruit tree that's planted by water is going to thrive because it's sucking that moisture up out of the, out of the water, out of the, the river or the stream into the soil and up into its roots, and it'll thrive. There's a line in a Lyle Lovett song about the tree that, that clings to the bank of the, river, of the river, but he leans to the water because he knows that's where his, his salvation is, is that water, okay? We that are blessed of God, any of us who are blessed of God because we, we strive to have that relationship with him are like a fruit tree that's planted, planted by the river. They, we thrive. This word says prospers, but it, it is not an earthly material prosperity. It doesn't mean we're going to get rich. It doesn't mean we're going to get famous. It means that he will bless what we do. The things that we do, we will thrive off the word of God. What is the, what is the water reminiscent of? What is it representative of? The living water, Jesus Christ. If we, are, if we are blessed by him, if we are part of that relationship with him, it's because we're like that tree that's planted by water. What's the water? The living water, Jesus Christ. And we prosper in that relationship. Spiritually, we prosper. Spiritually, we grow. Spiritually, we become more Christ-like. We stop wanting to sin, and that's part of the sanctification process. Folks, sanctification doesn't mean you never sin again in your life. That's going to happen, but ultimate sanctification ain't going to come till you're in heaven. Till we are in our perfect bodies at the end, after the judgment and everything, we're completely sanctified. There will be no more sin. Right now, we're still going to do stupid stuff we ought not to do. But it is a process of trying to become sanctified, which means we are not bent to sin anymore. We are bent to be like Christ, which is a complete transformation from our sinful, earthly, lost selves. That's why Paul said, Look, God, deliver me from this body of death. 
because the body we're in now is just a dying corpse waiting to die. But there will be a time when that'll be renewed and it'll be reconciled and it'll be sanctified so that there is no more sin, no more death. But unlike the wicked, those that are blessed are like that tree by water that thrives. Unlike that, the wicked, whose days of pleasure and freedom are numbered, especially when it comes to the spiritual things. The wicked will not stand or prevail in the judgment, but will be swept away and burned up like chaff. There is no way, you can look at this several different ways. If you stood in the judgment of Christ, in the judgment of God, at the, at the judgment seat at the end of the world, you will be on your face. You will not be able to just stand there. You're going to be on your face if you're of the lost world, if you have rejected God. You, can't, you, you won't even be able to stand. You will be obliterated off your feet. And you could take that word stand to mean prevail or survive. You will not survive it. You will not survive it. You will be cast off into the lake of fire that is prepared for the devil and all those that follow him. And if you're not for God, you're against him. If you're at enmity with God, you are against him. And if you're a friend of the world, you're at enmity. So you're against God. And they will be thrown away just like the chaff. They used to winnow away and, and shake the wheat till everything that wasn't wheat would blow away in the, in the wind. And then they would gather up all the wheat and the chaff would either blow away in the wind or it would be gathered up and burned. They will not be allowed to stand in the presence of the righteous. Those of us who are, are those who are righteous through Jesus Christ. See, our righteousness is not righteous at all. Our righteousness is filthy rags. But when we are allowed by God in His grace and His mercy to trade that for the righteousness of Christ, when we stand before God in the judgment, He looks at us and what does he see? Does he see our righteousness? Does he see our actions? Does he see our behaviors? No. He sees that we're washed in the blood of the Lamb and we're made righteous by Christ's righteousness. God will not allow the sinners, the scoffers, the lost, the unrighteous to stand in the presence of that. Two different times of judgment, the lost and the saved. And it says then at the very tail end of that passage in, in verse 6. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows it. He knows what our way is going to be. He knows what's going to happen with us. And he knows the way of the wicked too. He knows our way is going to be good. It's going to be something good. But the way of the wicked will perish. Where do you stand today? Are you walking in the counsel of the wicked? Or are you sitting at the feet of Christ? Are you listening to the world? Or are you listening to God's word? We have God's written word in the Bible. We have his living word in Jesus Christ. I hope that you will pick and choose wisely and follow Jesus Christ. If you're listening this morning you don't know jesus christ as your lord and savior god's word says in romans 10 9 and 10 and then in verse 13 if you confess with your mouth that jesus christ is lord and believe in your heart that god has raised him from the dead you will be saved and in verse 13 it says anyone that calls upon the name of the lord shall be saved won't you do that this morning don't let this day pass without knowing that you're a child of jesus christ that you have a relationship to god through jesus christ by salvation in your heart, by confessing with your mouth that he is who the Bible says he is, everything about him is true that the Bible says, and believing it in your heart. It's not just saying the words, but it's believing it in your heart. Won't you do that this morning? If you've done that, but you're surrounding yourself by the world, you can't hang out with the world like the world and continue to walk in an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. I guarantee you there's somebody in particular that I'm thinking about right now and you know me, and you know me well, and I know you well, and you're doing just that. 
I'm not going to say your name. I'm not going to say anybody's name here, but you're in my heart. I want you to know I'm praying for you because I think that's wrong. And I think you're leading your whole family away from the Lord by doing what you're doing because it seems fun for a season, but it will not be. And do not be mistaken. God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. Do not be deceived. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. Thanks for listening.